And in keeping with that time I've just been talking about, the early 20th century, we begin now with Eric Knowles. These ladies, have they been girlfriends of yours for quite some time? Um, about 45 years. Mm. I can't believe you've had them for 45 <laughs> no, years. No, <laughs> gone down a few generations, but uh, go through the family. So I think they're a right pair of... I, I can't really say the flappers, because I, f I think of a flapper as being sort of 1920s. And I think we're a little bit later. We're into around about 1930s with these girls. In right. fact, I go as far as saying that um, they probably date from around about... 1935. Um, these girls are highly charged right. uh, in every sense because um, you see this orange. Yes. Um, to achieve that orange, you've got to use uranium oxide. Right. So believe it or not, if you put a Geiger counter to them, yeah. you'd actually get a reading off them. Okay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't handle them too much, actually. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we have a look on the base, um, it's all there. Uh, what we have is the name Goldscheider, Wien. That, of course, is the, the Austrian way of, of, of spelling Vienna. Yeah. And uh, we turn it upside down again. Uh, you don't have to be too clever to know it comes from Austria, because right. it says made, made in Austria. Austria. <laughs> now, Goldscheider, um, as a firm, have been going sort of since the 1890s. And, but I think their most interesting pieces date from the 1930s. The colours give it away for being Goldscheider. And also these, these faces and the way that they've done the hair. Yeah. Um, it's almost like an Afro-Caribbean type of hairdo, yeah, isn't it? Yes, it is. um, and they don't care what colour the hair is going to... I mean, I've seen, I've seen um, gold shadow figures with green hair oh, and right. orange hair. Um, <laughs> it didn't really matter. I suppose they were the sort of early punks, if you will, of the 1930s. <laughs> um, have you ever had them valued? No, not at all. No, no we ever, haven't. You've, you've pondered it. I mean, yes, you, that's no, why you're here today, aren't yes, you? Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> to ask somebody like me. Yes. Well. I would tell you now that um, I notice there's a little bit of damage to one hand, yeah. but this is such a rare group right. and a very rare. I think I've only ever seen one other in 20 years that I've got no hesitation in saying that I think it's worth between 1,200 and 1,800 pounds. So um, <laughs> there's quite a ticket there, isn't there? Yes, if you wanted there is. to go on a on a trip such as these girls are about to end <laughs> yes, on a cruise, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> yes, make it a cruise and I'll, right. carry, I'll carry the bags. All right, thank you All very right. much. We've used it for the Christmas cake each Christmas year, cake. apart from when it's on the wall. Uh, it's a, actually for bread, um, ears of corn, um, and waste not, want not, very typically Victorian, of course. And it was made in, um, in it first made in, in um, 1848 and designed by a man called Pugin and made by the great Minton factory. Pugin, of course, was um, one of the great Victorian designers, uh, and um, he um, produced, of course, a lot of work on the Houses of Parliament. And one of his great um, works was uh, designing encaustic tiles, that's medieval-style tiles made in the Victorian days. And this really is a development of the encaustic process of producing tiles, but turned into a bread plate. Um, and it's one of the great seminal pieces of Victorian art. Actually, it's splendid. Anybody who collects Victorian art of this type has to have a Pugin bread plate made by Minton. So it's rather splendid. Oh. And apart from the fact that you've been using it as a Christmas plate and um, hanging it on a wall, it's still in very good condition. So uh, it's rather nice to come through the family, has it? Yes, it was my, well, it's always been in the family house and it's my great aunt. And I think her, her parents had it first. And it's just been carried down. We've always kept it and always liked it. Jolly nice indeed. And they were a London family? Uh, yes. 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 Have you any idea that it's valuable or not? I've got no idea about it. I mean, you just it. have it hanging around the yes. family? Yes, it's just... Just shillings like of value. Yeah, you like it, it yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, a collector of this sort of thing would give something like about £800 or more for one of these. OK. So, careful with the Christmas cake of future, won't you? But use it for think, bread. I don't think you'll see anything now but the wall. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> They were a set of 12, undoubtedly. Yes, um, yes, they were. One disappeared. And that's rather a shame. Tell me, do you use them at home? Constantly. That's very good. They must as say... As coffee spoons. They were meant as uh, spoons for ice, apparently. Yes, that's very likely. They show um, conventionalised scenes from, from Moscow. Yes. Uh, the, the, this one is the Kremlin. Oh. And, and um, one next door to it is the Uspensky Cathedral which is where the Tsar and Tsarina were crowned and has yes. a very special significance for the Russians and for the, for the, for the yes. Muscovites, of course. And they're made by the court jeweller to Tsar, the Tsar and Tsarina, who is called Klebnikov, and he worked in the old Russian style. Yes. The, the sort of candy twist handles of the spoons are 
in the 17th century taste. Mm -hmm. And so too is the technique called niello, which is um, a black sulfurous alloy let into the surface of the yes. silver. It's a very Russian technique. Yes. And they, they were made in Moscow in, in, in 1888. Russian silver is very conveniently has the, the date stamped on it. Oh, it's not useful. as useful. It is useful. It's not do as they difficult. still do this kind no. of work? I'm afraid they don't. Uh, they, they, I think there's a certain amount of revival, but unfortunately mm -hmm. they don't have the patronage that they had before the, the revolution. Oh, yes. yeah. Have you any idea of what they might be worth? No idea at all. I think if they'd been a, a complete set, I suppose one would have valued them for something like a thousand, twelve hundred pounds. Yeah. But sadly, with one missing, I suppose um, eight to nine hundred is more realistic. <laughs> Not bad at all. Yeah. Look at what we got here. Now, this is something that you brought in. This is a Whistler etching in this uh, rather, rather decrepit rather old frame. Hope, I rather <laughs> hoped it was. But well, it's I, absolutely wonderful. I could only see the W, actually. Well, it's got the actual signature in the etching, yeah. 1859, and yeah. it's got this um, butterfly motif uh, and down here, which yeah. is his, um, his sort of trademark. 1859? 1859, and it's um, a really wonderful etching, this, of, uh, on the Thames, his, uh, where he, um, the scenes he specialised in, particularly. But uh, where do you get this? It's a, it's a rather wonderful find. Well, it was, you're never going to believe it, but it was in Caen during the war. Uh, had a ground sheet and a blanket and an overcoat. We threw it down. Uncomfortable night, among many uncomfortable nights, as yes. you can imagine. Yes, I can imagine. I'm sleeping on it. Well, you were sleeping on this? Sleeping on it. Really? Well, I couldn't see in the middle of the pitch black, you know. Whistler is considered uh, quite rightly one of the great etchers of all time and this is yeah, a yeah. this is a really tremendous example um, needs specialist research to determine yeah. exactly yeah. what it's worth yeah. but it's certainly going to be worth uh, well into the hundreds possibly even over a thousand pounds so um, you know, it's uh, yeah. a pretty wonderful thing to have stepped on and it's a wonderful a wonderful <laughs> story thanks very much okay. what have I been what have I been what a wonderful a ventriloquist jug. <laughs> I've never seen one. Have no, you? Nor have I. Absolutely astonishing. And it's made out of papier mache. And the mouth, which goes up and down, is it's leather. Up, it's up and leather. Isn't that wonderful? That's beautiful. Yeah. Actually, is that not quite valuable? I've never seen one like it before, so it's it's worth what time will pay for it. But sure. I think it's it must be a few hundred pounds. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> one day I saw this on top of the dust wagon and it was up there for about five or six weeks and I kept looking at it and eventually I approached the dustman and I said to him, what about the brass plate on the top of the wagon? And he said to me, if you want it, he said, go up and take it. And I did. I don't think this is a, a marriage dish. I think it's more likely to be an arms dish because of the inscription that would have run round the edge of St George and the Dragon here in the centre. Um, that's obviously largely been polished out now. Um, and the date suggests 1700. I think it's rather earlier than that, uh, towards 1600 in date, perhaps somewhere in the middle of the 17th century. Um, what sort of value do you think it has? Well, I thought perhaps 70 or 80 pounds. I don't know where I got this notion from, but I just had this notion. And, and also it's a little bit worn and battered. <laughs> oh, yeah, without a doubt. But, but still, I think the, the 70 pounds that you, you're looking at mm -hmm is very low. Mm -hmm. um, in good condition, mm -hmm. these can make up towards a thousand pounds. I think this is probably about 250 mm -hmm. to 350 pounds mm -hmm. at auction. Well, that was a nice little climb, wasn't it? It was a well worth climbing mm -hmm. on it top was, of wasn't it, you know? The way. It's a very early moving picture machine. How is it? Has it got a, you know, has it got a particular name? Or? Yes. And, uh, I mean, I'm very I'm, clever. I know it's, it's called it's, it's called the Kenora. I mean, it's, I didn't know it had a special. I thought that was a probably title. just a title. Yes. Well, the the adult version, if you like, the grown-up version of this is called a mutoscope, mm. and that's perhaps people most know those through what the Butler saw machines at the yes, end of a pier. Yes. And this is the equivalent. What you have here is a reel of photographs. Mm. Each photograph is slightly different to the one 
after it. Mm. And by flicking it through, you get this illusion of movement, like a flip yes. book, made from really the turn of the century right the way through to about the mid-1920s. And they were very popular, particularly the least expensive ones. Mm. What are the, the various films that you've got there? Well, the one that's in there, um, I think that is um, Victoria's Children. This one um, is Cricket Match. This one is called The White Dove, and it's and it's a dance a dance one. And oh, can I have a look? And at the end, she it sort of eventually she goes down into the oh yes, she's into the she into dancing. the dove at the end. Dancing, 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 and then she becomes a dove. That's Amazing. Right at the end, yes. Ah, great. Now, where does it come from? Well, my grandmother had it, um, and when we were children, we always, you know. We played with it when we were children, when we went to stay with my grandmother. I mean, presumably sh that it was bought for, you know, my aunts and uncles and everything to use. Well, I'm now, I'm not going to resist the temptation any longer. I'm actually going to, to look through it. And yes, here we've got lovely. Oh, yes, that's, that's super. Good. Oh, yes, here they are doing their, doing their thing. Shoulder arms. That's it, yeah. Now, it's obviously in, in need of a little bit of attention underneath. Yes, I think it's Can the, I have a look down there? Yes, I think it's the... Um, there we I have the... probably some of the little teeth are a bit... Yes. Yeah, it's a so very simple mechanism. You've got, you've got mm. the screw and the cog, and as it turns round, so yes. it, so yeah. it uh, affects the, the reel of photographs. Value-wise, well, how much would you have to pay for a sort of computer game set up these days? I don't know. I would surpri be very surprised if you got much change from three or four hundred pounds. And in fact, this then begins to look rather inexpensive mm. if you value it at four to six hundred pounds, yes. which, which is what I feel that the value mm. is now. So it's really perhaps the same price as a tip top computer game. Yes, but more interesting, really. Much more interesting. <laughs> well, my wife got this from her grandmother um, in its battered state lost fingers from cleaning over the years and um, basically an heirloom from her and so I don't know how my wife's grandmother got it at all so it's it's been passed through the female line of your wife's family as far That's as you right. can tell if I were to tell you that it represented sexual frenzy <laughs> and it came through the female line would you be at all worried well <laughs> should I <laughs> um, she looks maybe harmless or cheerful enough and indeed the figure is a, a young girl called Hania and she was a very very beautiful Japanese girl very beautiful uh, on the outside and she got terribly interested in a monk who she thought was very dishy. Yes. And she pursued the monk and courted the monk. And the monk, having taken his vow seriously, decided he'd have none of her, yeah. quite literally. And he decided to hide himself inside a great bronze bell. Yeah. Uh, Hania, by this time, was getting a little impatient, uh, to put it mildly. And she knew where he'd hidden himself, and yes. she started running round and round the bell. And she, I know you're in there, she said. And she kept on striking the bell with her wand. And as she kept on striking the bell, the bell got hotter and hotter, yeah. rather like she was getting hotter and hotter. And as the bell got hotter and hotter, she started transforming into a dragon. The bell got hotter and hotter, and it, it in fact, melted with the unfortunate monk inside. inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very popular story in yeah. Japan, and in this particular instance, uh, the piece is made of an earthenware which uh, I would tie down to the Kutani group. The actual clay of the piece, which um, is more obvious, uh, and sadly, several of the, the extremities are quite broken. Uh, the clay is exposed here in the chips. Uh, does suggest a date of some somewhere around the 1870, 1880s. Yes. Had she been in perfect condition, she'd obviously be worth more than she is now. In her present state, I'm going to say she's worth maybe 100 pounds, 150 yes. pounds, something of that order. Fascinating. I always wondered. I now know. <laughs> Paul, I suppose the most frequently asked question 
is that what are going to be the antiques of the future? And in a sense, here we have it. Yet it's also true to say that only a few years ago, none of these things would form part of an antiques register. So, so what's changed, really? Well, I think we've got to go on. Art goes on, antiques goes on, design goes on, collecting goes on. New generations emerge who want to see different things. They want to see the things their parents had, their grandparents had, and we're no longer in the 18th century. We're in the 20th century. We're nearly in the 21st. And we've got to look at the things of our own time, partly because they're as good as the things of the past. The group that we see here excites me enormously because what we're looking at is the best of 20th century British design. A wonderful table with Art Deco styling of 1935, and on it a range of wares that are absolutely in keeping by major designers of the time. But, I mean, do you really believe that? Do you honestly think that the standard of design and craftsmanship represented by this table is the equal of anything that was produced, say, in the 18th century? I think so. I think it's as well made. I think the design is as interesting. I think there is a return, or there was a return, in the late 19th century to craftsmanship technology, the use of materials, the love of the finished surface, interesting shaping. This is modernism, but it's modernism that was acceptable at the time and has gone on being acceptable through the 30s into the 1950s. Let's look at some other examples. These mugs here. The mugs by Eric Revillius, a great designer of the 1930s working for Wedgwood, introducing the styles of lithography into ceramic design. With him, Keith Murray, a New Zealander, designed this vase and this glass dish. An architect outside the business, at coming in as an outside designer, imposing a style of elegance and universality, which is as good as anything that Desire the First did in the 18th century. This vase is timeless. Mm -hmm. Skeeping, a great sculptor in his own terms, the first husband of Barbara Hepworth, who he greatly influenced, although nobody acknowledges it, doing a range of figures for, um, for Wedgwood, and imposing, again, modernity in a way that was at the same time very commercial. Modern art being sold for a broad market. This is a great uncle of mine. A great uncle. Oh. Um, who, who, uh, when that was killed, when he was killed, uh, they had a photograph which uh, they uh, gave to Sir John Labrador. Well, this is the point. They gave it to the man who, in some ways, was the leading British portraitist of the time and uh, a very, very um, important name in British portraiture, John Lavery, as we see up here, painted by John Lavery in 1918. So um, the grieving parents presumably wanted to make a, a monument to they their did. son, yes. and they went to the best man, which is yeah. a very, very touching. I mean, well, how, what did he? You say he he worked from a photograph. Yes, it's and this he, photograph. And you've got it here. Yeah. How fascinating! You've got the very photograph that Lavery himself worked from posthumously. Yes. And um, as you can even see, if you look carefully, there are, it's squared up. The so that yeah. um, the artist could transfer it onto the canvas. Yeah. It makes it easier to work from this grid system. Yeah. How fascinating, because that's a little, little bit of insight into the way Lavery worked, it's too. And, um, well, I mean, one, one can see the, um, the resemblance is pretty good, because that's actually a photograph, too, of the, of, of of the, the picture. The final you know, picture, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, it's a, t it's a touching document, really, in its way, it isn't is, it? Well, it is. It's a nice family heirloom. And a family heirloom. heirloom. And with this sort of family portrait, it's so difficult to put a value on it mm. because, um, in many ways, it's unique and irreplaceable to the family. So yes. how can yeah. you put a replacement value on it? But I suppose, looking at it um, brutally commercially, if, the picture, if a picture like this by Lavery came on the market, um, it would fetch probably somewhere between one and two thousand pounds. Really? Something like that. Which is a, quite a lot for, a, for, for an portrait. ordinary family yeah. portrait of that yes. date. Yes. It's very rare to see military pistols from the 17th century. I mean, they very rarely turn up on the collector's market and they certainly don't turn up on the Antiques Roadshow. This one is from the period of the Civil Wars, 1642, 1649, and it's a a cavalry trooper's pistol, relatively crude, fitted with an English lock, or as they're known by collectors as a dog lock, from the name of this little tiny latch at the rear, which actually holds the cock in position to make sure that when it's stuck in a holster on the front of a horse, it doesn't go off inadvertently. Things like that could obviously ruin your entire day when it's uh, <laughs> This is an interesting pistol because it is one of the first of 
the sort of semi-regulation contract style of pistols that right. uh, was produced. And it was probably made for the new model army that uh, Oliver Cromwell produced to give those crushing victories against the king in the civil wars. We'll put that one to one side and move on to this one, which uh, is really an extremely important pistol. This dates from the reign of James II, who was the, uh, the last Catholic monarch, and he reigned from 1685 to 1688. This really is getting towards regulation style, and it's actually on the lock plate there has the king's cipher with a crown and his initials J2R. Uh, as I said, you can date this very, very accurately to that period, and any military arm with James's cipher on must naturally be very rare from the simple fact that A, they were made an awful long time ago, and B, he didn't reign for very long. Now, this has got the French lock on it, which, as you can see at the back of the cock there, there isn't any little catch just to hold it in the, in the safe position. The safe position is achieved by a notch on the tumbler, which is inside the lock, right. which actually locks the whole thing off, and it's called half cock. And consequently, the expression that we have in the language today, going off at half cock, which means that something has gone off before you intended it to and hasn't sort of really been started correctly, comes from firearms. The same expression, flash in the pan, comes from the priming powder that comes into the priming pan to set the charge off. If ju that just flashed and didn't set the main charge off, then yes. It, it, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the way these things actually come into the language. A lot of them are derived from arms and armour and firearms. Yes. Do you collect or are they family pieces? Well, I have got a few pistols in a collection. I haven't bought any pistols for a good number of years. And in fact, both of these I bought about 12 to 15 uh -huh. years ago. Um, the first one with the dog lock I bought in a, an antique shop in London, uh, not very far from here. And um, this uh, James pistol, I, I actually bought at auction. Really? How much do you, did you pay for them? For the one with the dog lock, I. I paid about £190 for, um, and because even I thought the James II one was rare because James II was on the throne for such a short period of time, um, I paid £500 for that. Well, I think uh, at, the, at the time you probably bought them cheaply. At the moment, I would value the dog lock at something like 1500 to 2000 and the James pistol at 3000 it is an exceedingly important pistol, and it's, it's great to see it here today. Thanks for bringing it. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, now to the final question in our three-part tea competition, and your opportunity to win as a first prize a voucher to the value of £2,500, or three runner-up prizes of £500, which you can then spend on antiques of your choice. And the prizes will be presented in London in June. This week, I'm joined by John Bly to talk about uh, tea caddies. John, where does the word caddy originate? Well, it's a corruption of the original term catty, which was a weight or measure of tea. And so many catties went into a trunk and shipped over to England. We then corrupted not only the, the pronunciation, but also the use of the word, because we adopted it to describe the little boxes that we put tea in for presentation in England. And by the 1750s, they could be of uh, silver, Sheffield plate, like that one. This one is of pottery or porcelain. And of course, my favorite, furniture. And here you've got the perfect example of a little piece of Chippendale furniture. Absolutely genuine. In fact, the smallest bit of English antique furniture you can collect. Well, you missed out only one detail there, John, and that is the subject of our question to you. In which language did the word caddy originate? And if you missed the other two questions in the series, here's a recap. Question one. What is this type of teaspoon called? Question two, which English lady gave her name to this style of teapot? Now, if you'd like to enter the competition, you can do so by putting your answers on a postcard and sending it to Antiques Roadshow Competition, P.O. Box 130, Leatherhead, Surrey, KT 22 9DB. And we must receive your entries, please, by the closing date of Friday the 25th of March. The winner will be the first correct entry chosen at random after the closing date of Friday the 25th of March. The winner, of course, receiving vouchers to the value of £2,500. And the three runners-up who will receive vouchers of £500 will be chosen in the same way. And if you'd like to discover the correct answers and indeed the identity of the prize winners, I'll give you information about that in the final programme of the series. So the best of luck with that. And now, back to our experts.
You're not a burglar, are you? No. Because when I left home this morning, that was on my windowsill. <laughs> the pear to it, I promise you, is sitting on my windowsill. Never. Isn't that incredible? Yes. I mean, I've never seen another one. No. Um, this, of course, is, you know who did Moorcroft. this? Moorcroft, mm. exactly, William Moorcroft. Mm. Um, he started uh, working at McIntyre's at the late 19th century and then set up his own factory. Mm. Um, he did very few miniatures. Mm. They are actually quite rare. Mm. Um, and I love this one. Mm. I mean, I found it in a, in a I was going to say antique shop, but it wasn't even yeah. that, it was a junk shop. Yeah, I think that's where my mother bought that. Is it really? Mm. How long ago? Oh, back in the 50s, 60s, you don't know what she paid I would for think. It. No, she, she she never paid a lot. I mean, no. it was like sixpence shilling, you know, junk right. shops around Victoria. Well, I paid a bit more for mine. Yeah. I paid four pounds for mine. Yeah. But it was quite a good investment. Yeah. Because this would make somewhere around five to eight hundred pounds. <laughs> I dropped it back there, too. And I had to say something. <laughs> you didn't, did you really? I did. Well, look, it's obviously dangerous in your hands. I need a pair, so thank you very much. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. This is a, a nursery rhyme, Ryder Cock Horse to Banbury Cross, but beautifully, beautifully designed, isn't it? That, that is an unusual one. That's great. But the, as far as collectors are concerned, actually what they're most interested in are these mechanical slides, because each of these has a movement to change by sliding this across, it changes the picture into sort of a rather sort of humorous situation. A long nose. Yes. And this is a, well, that's terrific. That's a sort of kaleidoscope here with a handle. Very, very nice indeed. And what, well, this is another one here, another mechanical one. This is a sort of Christmas scene, but this is lithograph rather than hand painted. Now, it was a gift, so you, you're, nobody had to pay for these. No. But they're worth quite a lot of money. Um, in fact, they're worth, they are worth a lot of money. I would have said that these mechanical slides that you've got here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those, they're going to be worth at least £10 each, and could be as much as 20 And the mechanical slide here, with the handle, the kaleidoscope, is probably worth 30 or 40 pounds on its own. I went to an auction in the forest and bid two pounds for a box of rubbish. Well, lots of bits in there, I thought it looked interesting. And I took it home, pulled it out from the bottom of this junk. It was dry and I put linseed oil over it. I hope that was right because it was so dry and it right. brought the glory of the wood back. And I sat all evening holding it because I was so excited about it. it well, now, what sort I don't know what it was made, I haven't a clue. I mean, well, old pictures were sort of 17th century. They did absolutely. drawings like that. Absolutely. I would put this. I, I would put this as 1690. It's not. Yes, oh, definitely. Oh, how fantastic! And it shouldn't come to pieces oh. because it's dry. The pegs. Yes. Are dry. I mean, it is a powder flask. Yes. Now, because it's a powder flask, before I go any further with what I think about it, Bill, you're the powder flask man. Well, certainly, John. In my experience, these are extremely rare you don't see very many of them coming onto the market and uh, from that that point of view it, it's a, a very beautiful and very desirable object and certainly to somebody who collects flasks to have this as the sort of foundation of a collection that then moves on to the right. from the 17th through to the 18th to the 19th century by the time at which flasks have gone out that would be a very very important starting piece i think that that, that as a powder flask, it would make somewhere in the region of 500, 750 pounds, something like that. Very, very unusual. Yeah. I actually, uh, while I agree with everything you say, <laughs> I bow to your superior knowledge, I think this has a greater value as an object than as a powder flask. There is a single letter there. What's that? Well, I think that could well be the stamp of the artist or, or, or an indication of the, of the man who carved it. Yeah. Because this is not uh, as I think you'll agree, a lot of powder flasks have a sort of naive quality. Yes. This certainly. is done by a very highly skilled professional carver. This is not something done by a chap mm -hmm. sitting in a forest in yes. the middle of the winter, you know, sort yes. of carving. Yes. This is done by a man with great ideas, great precision, yes. lovely feel to it. And, and it's amazingly tightly crisp executed. And exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. Yes. And there is significance in that bird at the top. I don't know what, but I mean, otherwise it wouldn't have a garland round it. But all of these flowers are truly representative 
um, and life, the whole thing is quite magic, I think. As an object, as a rare piece of early carving of this type, I would insure that for £2,000. <laughs> <laughs> no! Yes, I oh would. My. Now, surely we've seen you before. Have you been on a road show before? Yes, I have. At Kensington Town Hall. You brought in the painting of yourself, That's didn't right. you? That's right, when I was ten. Yes. In a blue dress. Oh, how lovely. Uh, so now you brought in this... Um, yes. This splendid array of Spode tea set. It really is marvellous. Of course, it, 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 it just screams Spode. It's a, yes. not, not only that, but one of the pieces is actually marked there, Spode. Mm -hmm. Um, 967 pattern, they're famous. Well, it's, I suppose it's an Imari pattern, but it's, it's one of their most classically beautiful patterns that they ever made for tea wares. And have you had the service a long time? Well, um, it belonged to my great-great-aunt Anne Hicks. Yes. Who lived in Hampshire, in the yes. Meehan Valley. She left it to my aunt, who was her goddaughter, and she left it to me. I think it's really rather marvellous. It, it's complete, apart from the teapot stand, I think. There, there should be a stand oh, under there for the teapot. Yes. Well, you I don't haven't remember that. that. No, no, I've never had that. You've never had that? Because I bought that myself. The, the teapot? The teapot, yes. You had that separately? Yes. Did you, where did you find that? Well, it was at, at uh, an antique dealer's fair. Yes. Many years ago. Yes. How much did you pay, do you remember? I don't remember. No. But I got it pretty reasonably. Well, you're very, uh, very fortunate, because it's the king of the set. I mean, yes, without it, yes, it it's not so complete. Yes. It's a super set. Made somewhere around about 1812, mm. the shapes of the teapot and the shapes of the cups uh, indicate mm. about that date. Now, do you think it's seconds? You bought seconds? Because some of the cups have got a little knob at the bottom, maybe the... Little, little blisters yes, or lumps. Yes, Good Lord, no. That was quite normal in those days oh, for things it? to have little defects yes, in them. Yes, this was yes. the richest pattern they ever did. Yes. And um, they would, if, if it was a second, they wouldn't put such a splendid yes, pattern on yes. it. No, this was a best service for somebody well, very, she was very... very proud of it, I'm What told. can it match mm. Now, we're... I'm worried about the value of this because I think it's rather expensive. I would think for this quantity of this super set, something like about three and a half thousand pounds. Oh dear. Yes. It's a it's frightening responsibility, oh. isn't it? But by the end of the 19th century, there was a, an awareness of tradition and an awareness of the need to go back to our roots. A piece like this, a beautiful secretaire by Ernest Jimpson, 1910, wonderfully made, has its roots in the 17th century, just as much as the 20th century. Can you see that? Is it obvious? I think you can see it in the shape, in the styling. It is not a copy of the 17th century, but it clearly grows out of it. At the same time, it fits perfectly into the, the new ideas of the 20th century. And in the joinery and the techniques of construction, yes, the way it this still is made, owes itself to it. It's a beautifully made piece in walnut. The detailing is everything that one would expect from an 18th century piece. The metalwork, the fittings are excellent. It's a secretaire. It has a beautiful movement in the way it flows out mm -hmm. so that you can use it as a practical piece of furniture. Um, it, it offers so much. And at the same time, with the exposed jointing, the careful choice of materials, the detailing, it links together the past and the present in a very effective way. Well, this is an absolutely charming bronze you brought in. How long have you had it? Uh, it's probably about 50, 40, 50 years. So you inherited it through the family? Yes, yeah, right, yeah. And it depicts a girl eating from a bowl, either food or drink. And it's interesting because on the back it's inscribed Art Union of London, 1909. Because it was founded in 1836, the year before Queen Victoria came to the throne, uh, for the promotion and benefit of the arts in this country. And the original idea was they had a number of subscribers who paid an annual subscription. And at the end of the year, they had a raffle. And you could win prizes. And some of the prizes you might win were pictures from the Royal Academy exhibition <coughs> or bronzes. Um, another factor about it that is interesting is that it's signed Goya. Um, he is probably French or Belgian because this style, and you can see the style of the girl, it's very free-flowing and uh, there's a wonderful quality about the dress. 
is very unlike the style one associates with the art union, which is much more stylized, if you like, much more formal, much more linear. I would say at auction, a bronze like that would probably fetch between five and seven hundred pounds. And the insurance <laughs> value should uh, probably be around a thousand pounds. That is part of his rations. His rations, yes. And he wrote on the back, let me see. Your king and country need you, and this is how they feed you. Perhaps a nice with jam and Yes, yes. I think you'd have to leave it to soak for a week. I'm sure you want milk. <laughs> well, because because it is a picture, strictly, but once it's onto a porcelain plaque like this, um, it comes un under the porcelain rather than the pictures. And in fact, this is probably um, a copy from a painting of the German school uh, in the mid-Victorian era. And they copied not only contemporary paintings, but they also copied old masters onto it. Yeah. Um, it was probably done in Berlin, where the best ones were made, but the others were done in Dresden. And if we see if we can get the back off, we might be able to see whether there's a um, mark on it. Sometimes you even get the title, and even more rarely, the name of... <laughs> uh, it's coming, it's coming, there we are. Now, what have we got? Not a lot. Ah, now look, here we are. We've got, this is quite interesting, we've got KPM, which is the Berlin mark, and then the scepter on top of it, which is the Berlin uh, scepter mark. Here we've got the measurement in inches. And the Germans used inches until, I think it was 1865 or 68. So this one was made before that date. Yes. So we can date it uh, to that period, which is good. The early ones tend to be better. Um, it's, let's move that for safety reasons. Now, this is a, a lady by a, a well, and it's probably the biblical uh, mm -hmm. Rebecca by the well. Um, the, the fascinating thing about these is that they're bought by the Japanese. They are the main collectors of them, which is extraordinary to me, but they will pay more. If this was on canvas of the same date, it would fetch 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's worth quite a lot more on porcelain. Is it really? More than 600 pounds. <laughs> Have you insured it? No, I haven't insured it. Oh dear, I think you should. This at auction would make close on 3,000 pounds bit of a shock. Yes. <laughs> this is a very remarkable Swiss enameled snuff box. How did it come into the family? How it came in, I don't know. It's, it's always been around and I've, I've liked it and it's come down to me now. Yes, it's almost unused. There's a tiny bit of damage at the back here, but that doesn't count for much at all. It's enameled gold. And as you can see, there's a panel of chased gold in the front of Poseidon in his chariot, um, drawn by hippocamps. And the yet more chased gold around the bezel here and it's really a presentation snuff box it's a way of giving a very grand gift to to somebody without embarrassing them with a sum of money in a sense and um, might have been almost a diplomatic presentation piece uh, it's made in Geneva in about 1820 and um, I suppose really must have to consider it to be quite valuable have you have you got it insured at all not separately no I think probably you ought to put it down for something like seven and a half thousand pounds insurance it would be difficult to find another one quite like it and I, I think it's um you know a really dramatic discovery one of the best um, Swiss boxes we've had on the show I'm delighted that you brought these in because uh, by Frederick Smallfield who I've always thought was one of the best Victorian watercolorists that there were really is there some connection with Frederick Smallfield in your um, family? My great-grandfather was an artist, and I think he's contemporary of his. Well, he must have liked your um, great-grandfather, because he gave him a wonderful, wonderful watercolour here. I mean, he was born in 1829, and um, in the 1850s, he did paint in this quite peripheralite, detailed way. Could be one from the 1850s, this, with the light on the top of his head and the detail of his shirt and um, his look down into this very impressively painted sort of quarry where his goats have strayed. All around, there's so much good detail. And remember, this is very fine work in, in watercolour, which is um, quite a 
quite a difficult medium to get this sort of detail in. And up here one has this nice, rather bucolic scene of uh, old men outside a cottage. And just again, I don't know if you've looked up at this, isn't this beautiful work up yes, here? Yes, yes, exactly. It's wonderful, isn't it? That is a joy in itself, but moving on to this, I, I'm absolutely amazed by this. Also by Frederick Smallfield, a very early one, 1852, he was only 23 when he did this. And it's a study of a lot of different pieces of silver that were exhibited in the Great Exhibition of 1851. What a lot of observation he's done, what, what skill he's rendered it all in, the reflections and the, the feel of the silver and the gold done here. This, in an auction, I can quite see being worth in the region of, uh, well, perhaps between four and five thousand pounds. And with this special inter specialist interest there for a silver collector, a similar amount for that one. Really? So um, I think the time has come to take some action. Yes, I think so. <laughs> well, this Antiques Roadshow from Olympia has been a unique occasion for us in many ways because for the first time we've been part of a Homes and Antiques exhibition with special events of various kinds taking place alongside the Antiques Roadshow. The result has been that we've attracted people from a much wider area than we would normally, including several from abroad. And talking of foreign parts, we're off next to Gibraltar. That's Roadshow on the Rock, next week at the same time. Until then, from all of us here in Olympia, goodbye. The Antiques Roadshow regrets that it cannot give any valuations by post.